We live in an ecosystem, uh, especially in our foothills, that fire is a uh, resident. Uh, it comes back at different intervals, but it is, frankly, part of the landscape. And uh, it's got uh, intervals that vary, some of them uh, naturally, but without suppression. So we're just kind of looking back to a time when fire was not suppressed, there was natural ignition causes, and uh, fire just uh, moved around and was dominated by natural uh, features as far as and phenomena is actually how it moved and and did its thing. So we uh, we at least we think we have a picture of what those ecosystems looked like and functioned like. And uh, in our case, in these lower elevations, this lower ecotone, uh, this ponderosa pine forest was probably a bit of a mixed uh, uh, fire regime return interval. So fire might have come back fairly frequently in some areas, and we would have a resultant forest that would be mostly grassy relatively few large well-spaced trees. We'd also have places though that fire did not return all that often and we'd have relatively dense uh, north-facing slopes typically and fire would return there as well but it would probably be a, a situation where it was a uh, crown fire type and uh, would probably replace the whole stand and a uh, new forest would regenerate at that time. So uh, there's just kind of a little picture of that ponderosa pine and as we move up in elevation uh, like you go up Risk Canyon, as you get towards Buckhorn, you're in a mixed conifer forest where there's going to be more Douglas fir, there's going to be some lodgepole pine, there's going to be some aspen. The only one standing. <laughs> the only one standing. How about that? Yeah. How about that? You're, you're forgetting so, John. Oh, John's down there. John. <laughs> yeah, very, very innovative. Very innovative. So, uh, so I guess the, the take home is that fire is a part of the ecosystem and uh, and uh, the fire suppression that has occurred over these many decades has an effect, especially in those places that fire would have naturally occurred a number of times. So when it did not occur, more woody vegetation got established and got going. So especially in that lower ecotone, we've got forests in Ponderosa Pine primarily that are, uh, are pretty dense. And then we see some effects that we don't necessarily want to see when we do have fire and that's real intense uh, fire behavior and even some some soil damage and some post fire effects um, it's, it is a little ironic how with fire comes floods and it's really hard for all the locals who have been evacuated for three or four weeks from the high park fire and they get on they get back to their land and three days later the monsoon season starts and they need to evacuate again and i've seen up with so many landowners up there it's 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 pretty rough but that's what we have with wildfires we come floods uh oh, we have floods the um I mean, do you all know what um like you hear about in the media, they talk about a 10-year uh, flood, a 10-year rain event. You all know what that means? It's like, um, on any given, a 10-year rain event means that at that particular point, you would expect that rainfall depth to happen once every 10 years. Same thing with a 10-year flood. It's expected to happen at that point in the stream once every 10 years. Now, with wildfire hydrology, we'll get a 10-year rain event, and from and what's going to come out of that watershed if it's heavily burned over most of the over most of that catchment, we'll see a hundred year, a hundred year, a 200 year flood come out of that catchment. Um, so these, the floods that we see after wildfires are the biggest floods we really typically see. And the reason why we're getting that is because when wildfires come through, it burns all the vegetation. It burns all that ground litter. And without that sponge, the rainfall that happens, most of it just runs off, or before it just be absorbed by the forest. And with that with and with all that um, with all that flooding comes a whole lot of sediment that's also being washed off the um, off that landscape, being washed down into the streams, down into the rivers, down into Puda River, um, down to the Big Thompson River, and that really impacts our water supply. It impacts our our beer production. Um, Ooh, no it, it's terrible. <laughs> so it, th these are very real issues that we have um, associated with, a, with, with the wildfire burns. It's the flooding and all the sediment that comes with it. It burns up all that ground litter and say, well, you have, a, you have, the, you have the, the big raindrops coming down during monsoon season. Say it is a fairly large raindrop. It impacts, instead of impacting 
the the upper canopy, the tree canopy, impacting uh, the vegetation, uh, um, uh, impacting the litter. Instead, it just impacts that soil and or what's left of the soil um, after the fire came through. So the sediment is all mobilized um, by that impact. And in, in addition to that, we don't have that ground litter that kind of builds these little dams all over these mountain slopes that slows that water down, allows it to infiltrate. Instead, it just pours down the mountain slopes, causes erosion, causes rills down these mountain slopes, and builds the sediment up in the stream channels, and eventually that'll end up going down the road. Fire comes accelerated geomorphic processes, um, accelerated erosion rates, everything <laughs> just happening larger scale, it's happening more frequently. It's really quite interesting from, you know, from a scientific perspective, though it's terrible for the landowners who are impacted by this every single time it rains. I think at the end of the day, it's really developing some real tangible, realistic expectation of, of what what we expect from this landscape. It's as 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 Boyd and and Steve have alluded to. It's dynamic up there. You know, there's there's a lot of ebb and flow. It's ecology, folks. Um, it's it's dynamic, and as part of that dynamism is this expectation for what we expect out of this watershed. We have this sort of superficial, static idea about our roads, our infrastructure, our communities that are overlaid this, on this dynamic landscape. And, and thinking about clean water, clean air, wildlife habitat, recreation, vistas, the whole gamut of things that ecosystem services that we, we get to enjoy as, as Coloradoans, as people in this community, doesn't really always jive really well with what the expectation of the watershed, of what the ecosystem is. And so, so thinking about clean water, understanding that maybe in all reality, if, if fire is gonna, if fire is gonna be a, I think I cut off. Hello? You have to speak up. Pop the breaker. Hello, hello, yeah. I had too much gravitas. <laughs> I'll just keep going and I'll just speak and project as well as I can. At the end of the day, it's just thinking about what we expect in, 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 a, uh, in our community. So there's this whole notion about good fire, bad fire. Can a good fire burn down your house as, 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 as well as a bad fire can? You bet. You bet. So what is our expectation in a, in a restored landscape is thinking about these are fire adapted landscapes, fire adapted ecosystems, and we need to build fire adapted communities, understanding that those are the risks we take in living in such a place. Everything from our, our outbuildings, our homes, all the way down to our water supplies, fundamental fabric of life, of, of, of our existence in, in, this, in this really dynamic and wonderful landscape. So what defines success? Well, for me, I'll tell you at the end of the day, I blew out again. <laughs> at the end of the day, no. At the end of the day, it's going to be understanding that that an ounce of prevention is always going to be better than a pound of cure. And here's an anecdote that I love to use. Everything from the for the Four Mile Canyon fire all the way up to our biggest fire um, until last, or I'll just say to. To this year was the, um, the the most expensive one was the um, the Black Forest fire. Now these are relatively these are not gigantic fires by you know by virtue they are they are uh, relatively small. So it's the difference of two thousand bucks an acre in a treatment a rest restoration treatment or fifty thousand bucks when you add up all the costs of property loss post-fire stabilization, suppression costs into that business. It just makes economic sense. One of the big differences between the four of us at the table here, besides my stature, is that I work for a nonprofit organization. Um, well, yeah, this too. And so, uh, yeah, this happened actually all last year after the fire. Uh, but, <laughs> And partially, scrambling around for resources actually do work. I see many volunteers in the audience today, and I know you don't have to raise your hand, but uh, I want you all to realize that volunteers give an inordinate amount of time, 
energy and passion to do restoration around Colorado. I also see landowners in the audience today, some who we have worked with and haven't. Uh, and one of the great things that I've kind of walked away from this experience with is how this event, the High Park Fire, really brought together this community of volunteers and the community of landowners uh, who live in the area that was burned. Uh, these are landowners who lost everything, including the trees on their property. You know, they, they came back not only to a, a home missing, but a black forest and black ground. Um, to, to see the outpouring of volunteer efforts who were raking seed into the ground, laying out wattles to control erosion, spreading tons of mulch on the ground, areas that we could not get other resources to, we couldn't get helicopters in there. Uh, wherever we could, we worked. We had over 800 volunteers so far to this day working in the High Park Fire area, and we're not done. Um, and so one of our mandates as a nonprofit organization was to help implement emergency watershed protection. Uh, Wildlands Restoration Volunteers typically works on, as you can imagine, uh, ecological restoration. Uh, when we look at something like post-fire uh, restoration, it's more of a reclamation. We need to get lots of green uh, grasses and roots growing quickly in the ground. We're trying to redevelop not just the vegetation cover, but a healthy soil that Steve alluded to that receives the water better to try to reduce runoff rates, control erosion. So that was our charge. Um, results have been pretty fantastic. We're working in the black of the black areas. So areas where just yesterday, believe it or not, in the rain, we're up there and we're still not seeing much growing. Uh, but where treatments were applied, where volunteers were on the ground, spreading millions of seeds, uh, we're seeing uh, vegetation cover upwards of 34%, even higher, uh, compared to areas that were not treated, where we're seeing maybe 2% uh, cover. So it's a big difference. Um, and again, uh, it's been tremendous. And I just want to thank all the volunteers, and I urge you to please come out. We need lots more hands on the ground to help these private landowners, to help protect our watersheds. Um, I don't have a booth here, so I'm going to say it again, Wildlands Restoration Volunteers. We don't have a booth, but please visit our website and come out, and uh, we'll feed you, and Odell Brewing will donate some beer as well. <laughs>
well, what are we restoring to? And what is that, what is that defined success? Is it the defined success derived from the ecology and what we understand how this, this dynamic landscape works? Or is it really a function of, well, we need X number of acre feet of year out of this watershed and we're gonna do whatever we need to get that. So, so the point gets to be is we can do anything better living through chemistry and engineering to maybe achieve some of those ideas, but at the end of the day, it's really going to be, is it tied to a realistic expectation of what the, the, the ecology and the watershed can provide us? And I hazard to guess that being aligned more with the ecology will probably yield a better set of results and meet our expectations instead of this better living through chemistry and engineering. But you aren't dissing all engineers, are you? <laughs> Just those that think that the globe is a perfect, perfectly smooth sphere. <laughs> <laughs>
but again, we don't know a lot about it. We are dabbling with stuff called biochar and trying to figure out how it could be used effectively to, to do um, remediation and, and stabilization work. But at these large catchment scales, the science is not there. Good afternoon, LaPorte! Yeah! I'm Phil, I'm with the NOCO Rebuilding Network. We're a network of over 100 building professionals, local nonprofits, and uh, businesses, local businesses in this area. And our mission is to build back homes after disasters safer, stronger, and smarter. That's how we define sustainability. And um, in relation to the fire, we uh, safer meant uh, using fire adapted and fire wise techniques, but um, I've always want has anyone ever heard of Ted? Yeah, I've always wanted to do a Ted talk because I thought it was so cool and and my idea for a Ted talk is that I would say I'm Phil and I'm with the NOCO Rebuilding Network and then someone else in the audience would stand up and say <laughs> And then someone else in the audience would stand up and say and then someone else in the audience would stand up and say, I'm Erica, I'm a volunteer with the NOCO Rebuilding Network. Yeah! And someone else would say, Yeah, and then the homeowners would raise their hand and they would say, NOCO bought my window. <laughs> NOCO bought my finishing. And more. I'm, I'm designing these things. <laughs> Half the people that you're si that, that are around here today um, have been involved with the NOCO Rebuilding Network one way or another. They're either volunteering, they're either they're giving their time and their expertise, they're building homes, or or they're having homes, they're building their own homes, or um, they're they're local businesses or nonprofits that have come to our Dirt to Drape series, which was 26 sessions every other Wednesday, starting a few months after the fire and going to June 5th. 2013 at the Bellevue Grange uh, every night so so that's one of the things that we did the educational series and uh, I just like to give a round of applause to all the people that have been involved and uh, would you join me uh, it is a great honor to sit here and represent all these people to represent our community and watch how our community can rebuild itself one house at a time and I think in light of the recent events, uh, we lost 286 homes um, from the uh, High Park Fire and Woodland Heights Fire combined, 83. And um, the scope of the uh, flooding is about five to 10 times that. So uh, our hope is to take the NOCO model, the education, the professional network, the uh, uh, local business supplier support, our, our integration with the long-term recovery group and our, our, our wonderful um, association with other nonprofits like NCRES and the National Center for Craftsmanship, Habitat for Humanity, et cetera, et cetera. Pull that all together and continue to rebuild Colorado's communities one house at a time. Best way to reduce energy is to build the house right. So as you're going through this process, unfortunately, uh, there may be a real good opportunity here to uh, pick up uh, some great tips from these folks that are here today and others. And I'm always there if uh, you're on the PVREA grant to uh, assist you as well. But um, let's, let's try to build these houses tighter and insulate them and seal them up uh, correctly. Make sure they're healthy and, and done right. You've got some experts here uh, all around us here today that I know real well that it will help you with that. Um, so um, if it's if you're a PVREA member on our grid, all you need to do is just give me a call at uh, PVREA, 970-282-6464. I've got some cards over here. And I have some information on my table if you'd like to visit with me and, uh, and talk about some other ideas or if you're just wanting to retrofit your house or whatever else may be going on here. So.
Uh, I'm cheap. <laughs> Basically not so much. Yesterday marked the retirement of our mortgage. So for the rest of my life, I'm counting on being a few hundred thousand dollars less in debt. However, I still needed a house. Because uh, a couple of those kids up there, actually three of them, one of them made the front page of the paper today, uh, still need a roof over their head. So when I started looking at um, the collection of things that I thought were important, um, A, a roof overhead, B, uh, having it to the point where it was in, as independent as possible. So, you know, being an involuntary, well, I'll call it becoming an involuntary uh, participant in this is like, well, if we're going to do it, let's see if we can find some ways. And one of the first things I did was I started looking at how we design heating and refrigeration systems. And when I looked at, we, we did uh, what's called the Airship Academy. And if anybody here is interested in, you know, learning some interesting techniques, Michael Reynolds has done a fabulous job of developing a curriculum. It was a six-week project, a couple of thousand bucks, but well worth it. And by the way, they gave us a 50% discount on that. So if you want to go down to Taos or if you got the time, that's a really good program. But when I looked at the way that the energy got used in those structures, um, even though they were incredibly efficient, approximately 65% of all the energy that they captured from the solar panels went into batteries to drive the dang refrigerator. And then I started looking at the refrigerator and I'm like, wow, uh, the dang refrigerator pumps energy out of one space into another one. Why in the world aren't we putting the heat out of the refrigerator into the dang hot water heater? And I'm looking at all these systems like, well, uh, the other thing I noted about even the most sustainable buildings is they wasted all the solar energy, that, or most of the solar energy that went on the roof. So when I sat down and had me a couple of margaritas and a couple more martinis, I said, well, why don't we turn the dang roof into a big-ass mirror so our house is likely to have the largest solar oven in North America. <laughs> over 4,000 square feet of solar collector to bounce the sun off and then when I looked at that I'm like well I bet if we use that smart we could drive both the refrigerator and the hot water heater and that's what that's sort of the basis of the system and then uh, with Mark's help over here and if any of you fellers would like to save a few dollars he's not only cut, ha cut, cut his prices in half but he's probably saved me probably $10,000 in screw-ups so far. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> um, so I don't do that, this necessarily for a living. There are just certain things you don't think of, so it's always important to note. And one of the things I'll say is if you need good quality help in this community, you really don't have to look much farther than you can throw a Frisbee. So anyway, um, I, I don't know that I have much more to say than that. It's just, you know, when you get into the details of the specifics of the technology, there's some really fabulous technologies out there. Um, I, I did a quick accounting of our building, and my goal is to get the structure up for under $50 a square foot. And I did my quick accounting on our foundation, and by the time we finished the concrete pour on the foundation, we'd spent under $2,000 on materials. And so we're well on the way to probably not only one of the most sustainable houses, but probably the least expensive construction costs, uh, perhaps in Colorado. We're sweating real hard to get dried in for winter. Uh, if that works, we should be able to do a little bit of in indoor work, but our, our final move-in date's uh, targeting next autumn. Um, just just because we have to be flexible, we're trying to spend so little money, we're, we're flexible with the time. The velocity that we're proceeding is about the same as you'd see with conventional house. Um, the sustainable stuff hasn't cost us much time and it's actually saved us quite a bit of money. And anybody wants further information, please feel free to contact me. Our website uh, that I'm blogging is esquib.com, E-S-Q-U-I-B-B.com. Um, if any of you are interested in volunteering, I've set up a nation, national registry for volunteers, for folks that are there. If you just go over our contact page, you can sign up. And um, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that before, but esquib.com, and then there's the Earthship Volunteers Registry that we maintain. Well, Passive House is a 
standard based on our super insulated homes from the 70s. I have with me the super insulated home book, which really was right on the money, and then cheap oil threw all that away. Well, it's coming back because it's not just cheap oil, expensive oil, it's running out of oil. And we're concerned about our future and our kids' future. Um, buildings use 40% of the energy in the country, and they don't have to. There's no reason for it. I look everywhere and I see junk houses built. Two by six walls to me are junk houses. Bad windows, poor construction techniques. I know uh, Bill up here has been teaching good construction techniques just to help make those houses better. But we can go a step further with Passive House. It's a standard that went from super insulated homes to Europe. They don't do green because it's cool. They have no choice. They are running out of resources and have too many people. So they really have embraced Passive House. Whole countries have embraced it as a standard. I'm not gonna get into all the boring details and numbers. I have a book over there that describes that stuff, but basically it's super insulated, thermal bridge free, airtight construction that gives you a comfortable home. It's also cheap to run. You don't need an air conditioner, you don't need a furnace. I know that I was talking to Danny about his project. He's got the insulation finished. His wall looks kind of like that model right there, nine and a half inch eye joist hanging outside of a structural system. And he does have his laptop with photos of it. He's happy to share. Um, his home is comfortable right now, sitting there overnight with, of course, no heating system in it. We're doing one for Andrew Mishler back here behind my table up in Masonville. It was 70, 72 degrees or 74 degrees this morning. No heating system. Uh, doesn't even have the HRV running yet. It's just sitting there keeping the heat that comes in through the windows. So we're capturing all the waste heat from the appliances, the people, the right amount of solar gain because you can cook yourselves out in a well-insulated home by having too much glass. And then we're running it through an air-to-air -air heat exchanger. That's the distribution the fresh air makeup system, 90% of the heat that gets dumped out through that sort of system gets captured, sent back into the other rooms that need it. It's a relatively simple system. Um, we have plans right over here we can you can look at for a house that we're starting in Fort Collins. It's gonna be a full passive house. We have another one going up in Livermore. We have Andrews up in Buckskin Heights out of Masonville, uh, Danny's project. There's another one that weren't not represented here on the Stowe Prairie Road for Joe Skelton. Um, they're, they're just gonna be comfortable. There's not gonna be drafts. There's not gonna be cold spots, warm spots. You're gonna love living in it. The project that we have on the books right now, the plans over here in Fort Collins, it's for a, a single man, relatively simple design. It's, it's a couple of slightly offset rectangles, two-story house. Um, he's got a attached two-car garage. He owns his lot. He owns his tap fees. The constructed cost, we're talking about 135 to 140 per square foot. So it's less than a good custom. It's got still decent things inside of it. Uh, one down in Broomfield that another associate put together last year with hardwood floors, tile, uh, good Amish cabinets, things like that for an older couple was 150 a square foot construction cost. So it's affordable. Um, we are working toward making it very efficient, very simple to build. We're just tightening up our methods more all the time. Three years ago, the idea to start the NOCO Rebuilding Network was that we would have something in place that could easily easily be stood up in terms of uh, people, resources, technology, materials, etc. In the, in response in the aftermath of a disaster, and uh, we really didn't anticipate this. <laughs> and I kicked myself for having this dumb idea, but. Um, <laughs> But the fact is that because we had the NOCO Rebuilding Network and because we had these all these associations with different groups, um, 
while the flooding was still going on, we were able to mobilize our network to get a thousand pounds of food to people stuck in the lower and the middle Buckhorn Canyons, um, along with diesel and other construction supplies so they could start building their roads and uh, finding a way out of their situation. Some of those people are here today. Um, so, so we started immediately with the flooding um, and then realized that t to build a house, especially after disaster, it, there's a lot of um, uh, time constraints involved. Winter's coming soon and uh, people are going through the shock of having lost their home uh, and everything in it. Um, the, there's an emotional recovery period that they have to go through. The design process takes three to six months. And then, um, you know, the actual building is one to two years. So uh, we have to start like four months ago to be able to be prepared to, to rebuild 1,800 homes. And, and these people that just lost their homes are, are looking at us kind of saying, how do you expect me to build back better or more sustainably or, or build our communities back when, you know, we're, we're underinsured, 80% of the people were underinsured by at least 30%. In the case of the flooding, the situation is even worse. And there's a possibility, you know, because a lot of them didn't have flood riders. We live in the mountains of Colorado. Why, why would we have flood riders? Um, that, that, there's, that we're setting up for quite a large social disaster. Um, so part of our mission is to try to find ways, you know, Mark and Mark, and Gary and everybody else have all been involved with uh, trying to find ways to help homeowners save money so they can get back to where they were before the disaster, but not just back to where they were with a home that was built 30 years ago, but back to where they were with a home that was built uh, um, just in the last year. And I think this is really important, not just for the homeowners, but for the extended community. And I don't mean to go on a big diatribe here, but this, this affects everyone that's uh, here at the swing station today because the better building we do in the aftermath of a disaster, each home that comes back better, each family that comes back stronger, each community that recovers affects our economic base. It, re it affects everybody in La Porte. It affects everybody in Fort Collins, Timnath, Windsor, all of Larimer County. And um, the fact we have kind of this wonderful support network and all these people in place that are willing to help, not just with NOCO Rebuilding Network, but all the people doing the, the mudding right now, uh, removing the muck and pumping basements and the, and the, and the, and the sewage and, and, and helping people uh, gain access to their homes when they've been uh, stranded up in the flood for nine days to 14 days. All these things that are happening, you know, it, it, it keeps people here in Colorado and it keeps our, our, our families healthy, strong, and, and our community healthy and strong. I, I just would encourage you guys to think about that extended model. So I'd start with an energy audit to begin with. Um, until you get a, uh, get a direction on where you want to head, um, that's, that's where everything starts. So with PVREA and members that are here, uh, those energy audits are incredibly affordable. Uh, right now they're at $100 and they'll, uh, if you invest $100 in your home, they'll give you a $50 rebate. That may even be better next year, I, I can't say yet, but um, um, you're going to get a fairly thorough audit uh, and, and some educational uh, information here that will help you make decisions as to where you want to go with your money and how you want to approach this house. Um, so I, I like to start with an audit. Uh, just to throw things out is really not the right way to do it. I found that out the hard way, So, and many others have as well. Some of our projects, and you can see the wall sample over here, Andrew is up Buckskin Heights, his project, and he's concerned about fire raging up that hill. So we do all we can to work fire adaptive technologies firewise into the construction. This kind of green material on the outside of the wall system there under the cement board siding is um, rock wool bats that's completely non-flammable. And we put that on the outside of the, of the insulation layer, which again has, you know, nine to 12 inches of a non-flammable insulation material that's packed tight. And then the structure underneath it. So 
when we're designing energy efficient homes, it's also being uh, fire safe. Joe Skelton's project, they're completely wrapping everything under the siding, under the roofing with gyp rock, with fire rock. So they're putting gypsum board under all of that, which was an engineering challenge, but we pulled that through, putting the the rock wool on the outside with those long screws is another engineering challenge and so we're working on all of those things. The young lady asked me the other day what branch of engineering and I got to thinking about that, you know, so someone go into is structural engineering. I mean we need to figure out how to make these systems work so they're safe and they don't fall down and they resist the forces that are gonna resist it. Um, all the forces. The thicker materials are the ones that can resist it better. Thin quarter inch siding will just flare right up and burn your house down. Um, even regular double pane windows are not the best because it'll blow right out. Phil knows this, he had quite a few of them happen to his house. Some of our passive house windows, because we use triple pane, we're even going with tempered glass. Get rid of that vulnerability. We had people, neighbors in the Crystal Fire, log homes, ICF homes, the windows blew out and burned the house out from the inside. The, the positive side of all this is that as, an, as a result of the fire and, and our collective community involvement, we now have bunches of FireWise certified architects, structural engineers, and we have uh, contractors who are familiar with the techniques and can put it together because um, it's one thing to make material choices that are in line with FireWise, but it's another thing to assemble those things correctly so they actually do the job that they're intended to do. Heavy timber performs better, so if you need to put a beam in instead of having three 2x12s that have gaps, you know, as that stuff does shrink and move, has gaps between it, a heavy timber will char and insulate itself I've seen fires in attics before where I had to certify that the two by fours are okay. And you scrape away three eighths of an inch of char and you still have a two by four because it's all still there. Well, I've been in buildings where heavy timber and a steel beam, heavy timber, they scrape away the char and paint it and the timber is all, or the steel is all twisted and warped out of shape and dropped. Um, so for heavy construction, you know, heavy timber is, is a good way to go even heavy timber joists on your deck. Uh, keep it clean underneath, that's a big thing. Get rid of areas that, that embers can fall into and stay there and ignite the needles that are laying there. And the keep the junk from underneath it. I just also like to add, with respect to all the people that used heavy timbers and lost their deck and their home, um, there are parts of a fire uh, especially in the High Park fire and other fires like it, that it doesn't matter what material you use, concrete, metal, wood, polyurethane, etc. People are going to lose their homes. Firestorm. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, that's just, that's a fact. Um, but and we're not saying that FireWise is a solution or fire adapted communities is a solution that means nobody will lose their home. Just like uh, um, FloodSmart and all the other things with the other disasters, uh, doesn't mean that you're not gonna something isn't gonna happen, but but we can reduce the frequency. You know we can we can put the odds in our favor and we can change the chances. I think another 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 in addition to what everyone has already said, you know our local lumber yards can carry materials. There there are there there are fire treated um, wood products which Mawson is now starting to carry. There's uh, the decking material, the composite decking. Some of it has uh, been rated by California Fire Code. And then they unrated it because uh, when it burns, it, it doesn't actually burn, but it melts and, and it's a hazard to firefighters because of the hydrogen cyanide gas that it emits. So, you know, I, I think, um, I don't mean to be vague or, or waffle on your question, but the point is it's not a total solution, but it's about making choices. Those choices start with site selection. They start with uh, mitigation. They start with uh, good, good forestry practices that the gentleman from the USDA recommended. And, and those go a long way into helping. And then material choices, installation choices, and, and, and the whole supply chain from, you know, uh, Mawson was able to get in the example of windows, double pane windows with just one pane that was tempered, the outside pane. 
And again, you come back to the fact is that we, we're not, it's not a rich community. People have limited funds and they have to make choices. We, we can't just buy the world. Mark, Mark has been doing a great example of uh, reusing and recycling goods and, and keeping his costs down. So a lot of esoteric fancy materials are not available to us as choices and we have to find a way to, to provide materials and, and, and installation techniques that, that a normal person can, can afford and, and be able to utilize in their home, both in the mountains, but also here in, in Bellevue and, and in Fort Collins.